Hey church family, I'm so glad you are here uh, joining us for our Connect Group video. We're kicking off a, a whole new kind of series uh, looking about uh, looking at who we are and how we are joined together as a part of the body of Christ and who we are as we are joined together. Uh, and uh, one of the, the analogies that our author gives us, he kind of describes a visit to the Redwood Forest and he talks about how redwoods um, can grow as tall as 350 feet tall uh, and 24 feet in diameter. That is a, a massive tree. And so you would think with a tree that size that uh, that the root system must be extremely deep, right, uh, to maintain that kind of mass above the ground. When the wind blows, those trees don't move. So the root system must go uh, 20, 25 feet deep, just like many other trees. But the reality is a redwood tree's root system doesn't go more than about five to six feet deep. Um, they don't go deep at all. So, so what is it about these redwoods? Why do they stand so tall in the middle of storms and winds and, and different natural things that happen? How do they continue to survive at such height and such size if their root system is only five to six feet deep? Well, the reality is what happens uh, is those root systems go out as far as a hundred feet feet from the base of the tree, and they end up intertwining with the root systems of other redwoods. So each of these redwood trees are united together; their their roots are tied together, so that when one or two or three trees uh, kind of uh, experience some sort of stress that would cause them to fall over, all of the other redwood trees that they're linked to help hold them up. Uh, redwood trees were never meant to, to be grown in isolation. If you have just one redwood tree with no other redwood trees around, it's much more likely that that redwood tree, as the taller it grows, the shorter its life is going to end up being. Because eventually wind or storm or, or, or some sort of a disaster is going to cause that tree to fall. But when you have a forest of redwood trees who are all linked together, they are impenetrable. Uh, they, they will not fall. They won't be destroyed because they hold one another up. Uh, and this is a, a awesome picture that our author has given us uh, because it really is, is what, what we are as the church. We are never meant to live in isolation as the church. We're meant to be joined together uh, and uh, separated from the church. Uh, a single believer is very weak. But when they're united with the church, a believer is strong. Uh, and so uh, today we're going to be looking in Ephesians. And this is the very message that Paul is trying to get across to the church in Ephesus. This is a church he knows well, a church he spent three years with. And, and he wants them to understand that, hey, you can't do this alone. And you shouldn't do this alone. You shouldn't do this in isolation. You shouldn't live life in isolation. Instead, uh, be strengthened by one another. And so uh, we're going to pick up in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, First, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23. Paul writes, He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So we need to we need to define who he is. Uh, he is the Father. And he's talking about Christ. Uh, and, and he also gives a name to the church. Uh, he calls it the body. There are tons of different names that we find in Scripture to describe the church, uh, a flock, the, the temple, the household, the gathering. But the one that we, we hear the most, the one that's used the most, is the body, and that is that really is a picture of what the church is meant to be. The body has arms and legs and toes and fingers and, and kidneys and, and all sorts of different parts, and, and all those parts work together uh, to function. But uh, uh, controlling all of the church, dictating its decisions, is the head, and that is who Jesus is. He is meant to be the head of the church, uh, and he didn't put himself in that position. The Father put himself in that position. Uh, God placed Jesus there uh, as the head of the body, the head of the church. And in the body, the church can't live apart from the head. 
Uh, that is a that's a that's a reality for us as individually as believers that we can't live apart from Christ. But also, it's a reality that we need to understand for the church, for the body, that apart from Christ, you are not the church. Apart from Christ, you are not the body, uh, and and we can't function uh, correctly. So we should always be seeking Christ in His direction. And here's the great thing about Christ: Christ is not a arrogant or abusive or, or authoritarian leader. No, uh, he, he is a kind and loving leader, but he is an absolute leader. There is no one else uh, who is supposed to be the head of the church, not the pastor, not the deacons, not the, the oldest church member that's ever been, not the most influential church member that's ever been, not the greatest Sunday school teacher, small group leader, uh, music minister, youth minister, fill in the blank. None of those people are the head. They are just pieces of the body. Some of them very important pieces, but not the head. They are not in charge. Jesus is the head. Again, placed there by God. And, and, and here in Ephesians, we kind of see this, this progression of how he comes to that place and how God's sovereign hand is in it all. God raised Jesus from the dead. God seated Jesus at his right hand in place of ultimate authority over every ruler. So he's put over death. He's put over all rulers. God gave Jesus an eternal rule, not only in this age, but in the one to come. God put everything under Jesus's authority. God appointed Jesus as head over the church, and God appointed Jesus to fill all things, to bring purpose to all that he has been created. Uh, it was given to Jesus by God, but Jesus is in all things a Above all things, an authority over all things. He is the head, uh, and so so. What does that mean for us? You know, how do how should we respond? So one way, again, as I've kind of already mentioned, we as the church should respond by seeking Jesus uh, in all the decisions we make. Uh, if it doesn't make more of Christ then we shouldn't do it. It doesn't matter how fun something is. It doesn't matter uh, whether something is an innovative and good idea. If it doesn't make more of Christ, we shouldn't do it. It's meant for social clubs. It's meant for the school system. It's meant for something else, but it's not meant for us. We are to seek Christ and to make more of him. And then again, also, uh, what this means for us is that we individually have to put Jesus as, as the head over our own lives. We have to submit to his authority. We have to submit to what he has called us to do. Uh, not what we want to do, but what he wants for us. Our author gives us a couple of questions to kind of help us work out the implications of what Paul's written for our lives and for the lives of our church as a whole, the body. The first is, how is being a part of a church different from being a part of any other organization? And the second question, what happens when we forget that Christ is the head of the church? Take a moment, maybe hit pause. Those questions will show up on your screen. And uh, whether you're in a group or you're by yourself, take a moment to work through those questions and come up with your own answers. And when we get to the other side, we'll continue on in Ephesians. So to answer that first question, how is being a part of a church different from being a part of every other organization? Well, being a part of a church gives us real eternal purpose. We can be part of other organizations and do good things uh, and have a lot of fun. We can develop personally. But when we're a part of a church and we're, we're all in and we're seeking Christ in that church, we're growing to who we were meant to be on, in, into, on into eternity. Uh, we're getting just a taste of what heaven is going to be here on earth right now as believers. And we should continue to pursue what that is. And that is pursuing Christ. So when we're part of the church, it is purposeful uh, and it is eternal. And it matters more than anything else we could do in any other organization. Uh, the second question, hey, what, does, what happens when we forget that Christ is the head over the church? Well, what happens is the church falls apart. The church was meant to have the head, uh, and the church becomes a social club. It becomes, a, it becomes just a, a hangout. It becomes just any other organization. If Christ is not the head of it, then it is destined to, to death. Uh, it could die by no members, no, uh, members no longer coming uh, because Christ has been has pulled his influence from the church, or it could die because everything it does is totally pointless and purposeless uh, because once again Christ has pulled his influence. But either way, the church without Christ is not the church. It's not the body, and it's destined to death.
Um, Paul kind of continues on. We're going to skip over to chapter 2 in Ephesians, looking at verses 8 through 10. And he writes, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So in our first section, we talked about uh, uh, who we are, what's the, the group that we're a part of, and that group is the body. It's the church, right? And Christ is the head of it. But now uh, Paul's kind of moving to how we become a part of the body, and he kind of lays that out. You know, uh, when it comes to, to clubs or, or teams or, or whatever, you know, when you join those you ask to join, you maybe fill out some paperwork, pay a due, you go to practices, you go to rehearsals, and you go to accomplish the agenda of that organization or team, whatever that may be. Uh, but that's not what the church is. We kind of mentioned that before. The church is not a club. The church is not an organization. No, the church is a, the body of Christ. So how do we join the body of Christ? That's exactly what Paul addresses here, kind of just step by step. The first thing it says is that we've been saved, right? So, so, for him to say we are saved, it implies that we were in trouble. And that is the reality. Before we are part of the body of Christ, before we have that understanding, we are in big trouble. Our sin has destined us to eternal hell, right? Our, our sin has completely separated us from God. And there's got to be an acknowledgement of that trouble. Before we can ever be a part of the body of Christ, we need to recognize that we need to be saved from the trouble we're in, and that that we don't just need to be saved, but that we need to be saved by Jesus, that he's the only one that can do that. The second thing that he, Paul kind of lines out here is that not only are we, are we saved, but we are saved by grace. And that acknowledges that this is not something that we have earned, but that this, this is something that we have, uh, that, that has just been gifted to us. It's not something that we deserve. It's something that God has offered to us. We've done nothing to gain it, but God has given it. Uh, we can't gain it. Only God can give it. So we are saved. We're saved by grace. And then it goes on. He says we are saved by grace through faith. Um, sometimes we struggle with defining what faith is. We may say that uh, faith is taking a leap or believing without seeing. But that's not really how the Bible describes faith. The Bible describes faith as accepting the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done to reconcile us to God. That is faith. Truly believing uh, that Jesus has saved us and reconciled that relationship that we had uh, with God. So we are saved. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace through faith, and then every aspect of our salvation is God's gift to us, not a work done by us, right? He says, not from work so that no one can boast. This is not from our own workmanship, right? We have done nothing to deserve the favor of God. It is a gift from God. And that way, no one can look and boast that you are required to walk in humility in order to be saved because you've got to recognize that you can't save yourself. So how do we become a part of an organization of, of the, of the organization of the church, right? What we really call the body of Christ. How do we become a part of the body? We're saved by grace through faith and we're saved and is a gift from God, not something that we've done for ourselves. And that's what comes first. However, we have been given that gift up from God for a purpose. And that purpose is to do good works, right? We are saved to do good works. We don't do good works to be saved. It's the other way around, right? We are saved and then we go to good works, but those good works are not pointless. They're not random. They're not by surprise. No, those good works are prepared ahead of time. And so as believers, as a part of the body of Christ, we cannot sit idle. We have to be out. We have to be involved in having gospel conversations and making disciples because that's why we were saved, because God loves us and wants to see us serve him. So our author gives us a few questions that we can look at here. Uh, the first one says, in your own words, how would you describe grace? Uh, second of all, what's the relationship between grace, faith, 
and works? And then the final question, how does it change our perspective when we view ourselves as God's workmanship? So take a moment, look at those three questions, uh, kind of come up with your answer, maybe write those things down, and then come on back. We're going to finish up in our last section. I really like that last question. How does it change our perspective when we view ourselves as God's workmanship? Uh, for me, when I view myself as God's workmanship, I see his sovereignty involved. I see his plan involved. I see how everything that he's asked me to do has purpose. And it's something he planned ahead of time. He made me to fit that task, whatever it may be. And so it gives me purpose and it causes me to want to continually seek him and seek him in thankfulness as he obviously has saved me, but also as he empowers me to continue to serve him. So I hope that maybe that's kind of how you look at it. If it's not, then you should look at it as you were created for a purpose. You know, when, when I make a chair, I, I don't make a chair for, for me to, to use, um, as a table, I can use the chair to sit at the table, but the chair is for me, for me to sit in, right? That's the purpose of the chair, not for me to eat on. That would kind of be gross if someone had sat on it and then you ate on it. I mean, I'm not going to go into details there. It seems pretty common sense, but uh, it's, it's, it's a picture really of what God has done in us. He's made us for a purpose. And that purpose obviously uh, is in the body of Christ, but it's to serve within the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ. So Paul is going to finish up here. Uh, we're going to finish up here with, with some of Paul's writings in chapter two, looking at verses 19 through 22. It reads, so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. So Paul really finishes up uh, here with this really awesome picture of unity. And, it, and to kind of help us have an understanding of it, we need to kind of look to the Old Testament. Uh, when we look in the Old Testament, we see that God has always had a people, right? Even in the Old Testament, he had the Israelites. Those were his chosen people and had been for generations. Uh, unfortunately, the Israelites oftentimes, instead of looking at that and, and being thankful and appreciative for being God's chosen people and using that to glorify God as motivation, instead, they oftentimes used it to, to, to act as if they were superior to others uh, because they said, hey, I'm God's chosen people and you're not. Uh, and, and that's that's not at all what God intended. And so, unfortunately, after Christ has come, you've, now you've got Jewish Christians who have who have come to a faith in Christ. But you also have Gentile Christians who have come to faith in Christ. For the Jewish Christian, it, this is really simple for them to continue to have this understanding that they have been chosen in Christ, that they're God's chosen people, because it's what they've always believed. And so they kind of continue in this this thought that they're superior to others. And then you've got these Gentile Christians who have kind of been always been told that they're inferior, that they're not quite as good as the Jews, uh, that their, maybe their Christianity is just not quite as good. And so Paul's trying to address this issue where Jews may be looking down on Gentiles. Both of them are believers, but there, there's no unity there. There's, you know, these people who believe they're better than the others. And you can imagine those Gentiles feeling inferior would begin to have some animosity towards the Jews who believed that they were superior. Well, Paul blows that whole thing out of the water, right? He says, hey, man, you once were completely separated from God. It's got to tell them, hey, look, you Jews, you thought that you were with God. The reality is you were working against him just like the Gentiles were. You were both foreigners. You were both strangers. Both of you were equally separated from God. But now in Christ, you are fellow citizens with the saints, right? Members of God's household. And he doesn't point out two different types of households. No, it is one household with one cornerstone. And that cornerstone is Christ. And what Paul's trying to express to these people is, hey, you are no longer separated. You are now united in Christ. Let him be the uniting factor. Uh, and the, the reality is this was an issue then. 
It's also an issue today. Uh, we have Christians from all over the world, don't we, who are different skin colors. They speak different languages. They eat different food. They have different accents. They worship in different ways and, and in different places and have different types of leaders, all different shapes and sizes. The, the, different, the differences between so many believers around the world is greater today than it's ever been. Uh, and unfortunately, we live in a very individualistic society where everyone wants to be separated into groups. They want to look at how they're different from others and somehow boost themselves up and, and call themselves superior. Uh, and we see this displayed in today's media. We see it displayed in our day-to-day -day activities where some people feel superior or inferior based on who they are as a person or, or, or the color of their skin or or where they grew up, whether it be right here in our own uh, city or, or it be on the other side of the world, this individualism can cause a lot of issues in the church. And so this message rings true for us, that we should set aside the color of our skin. We should set aside the, the place we grew up, the place that we go to school, the socioeconomic status that we may hold. All of those things, they're, 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 they're just not important. They have no bearing on who we should be if we're believers. Instead, we should set all those things aside and identify first as being a part of the household of God. Identify first as being a part of the body of Christ, the church. And that really is what Paul wants to see happen. He wants to see unity happen. And that's what we want here. We want unity in our church. We want to be recognized as the body of Christ. And so I hope that that's something you will strive for, to set aside those individualistic things that, that maybe make you who you are. Not that all those things are bad, but instead, let the number one thing in your life be that you are a believer and that you're a part of the body of Christ. Um, our author gives us a few questions here for us to work through. I'll read these first three, and then the last few will just show up on your screen. I want to encourage you to work through those uh, to, if you're with someone together. And then if you're not, maybe alone, I like to write mine down. I like to journal through mine. I'd really encourage you to do that. So those questions are, how has the church played a significant role in your life? Um, what are the responsibilities and blessings of being a member of God's household? And then finally, how can we acknowledge our differences but celebrate what we have in common in Christ? Uh, those are some challenging questions. And I think those are some questions that are uh, very uh, specific very relevant to the world that we live in today, please take some time to really work these out. And don't just work them out, man. Let's let's work them out and see what, what do we need to change in our life to see the truth come out, to see uh, our identity uh, and our foundation to be in Christ and who he's called us to be. Uh, that's going to be hard. And so as you are working to do that, I want you to know that we love you and we're praying for you.